Good evening. It is indeed a pleasure to be with you at this General Synod. And it is an honor to be invited to give the sermon in this worship. This is a powerful sign that our sisters and brothers in the United Church of Christ care for the little town of Bethlehem, that they are faithful partners to the Palestinian Christian community and to the cause of justice and peace in the Holy Land. Tonight, allow me to read the Bible for you with Palestinian eyes. Remember, the Bible did not originate in the Bible Belt. <laughs> Thanks God, I mean. <laughs> I always remind people worldwide that the Bible have on the back if you look carefully, a stamp that says, Made in Palestine. <laughs> I was born in Bethlehem. I know this sounds biblical, <laughs> but I can't for it. And I mean the real Bethlehem, not Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. <laughs> My hometown, the little town of Bethlehem today, is a city surrounded from three sides by a 25-foot high wall and 22 Israeli colonies called settlements. When I crossed the checkpoint from Bethlehem to Jerusalem, which is only five miles away, which looks more like a big prison with watchtowers, tripwires, cameras, turnstiles, metal detectors, and scanning machines. More often than not, there are long lines of weary folks waiting to walk through the checkpoint. And there is only one line out of three existing lines which is ever operational. The other two are supposedly out of order. Behind a bulletproof window sits a young Israeli soldier not even 25 years old with a machine gun. Outside, people wait in lines for a long time, sometimes hours, while inside, things crawl. In the lines are children trying to attend school, nurses who are late for their shifts, old people wishing to go to pray in Jerusalem, those seeking medical treatment if they have the permission. In midsummer, it is very hot, smelly, and crowded. People slowly lose patience. They push left and right, yet nothing moves. The young soldiers may be in a bad mood or is texting his girlfriend. And then suddenly in that cavernous hole, there arises the cry of an old Palestinian woman standing in her hand-embroidered dress, raising both hands towards the sky and imploring loudly in Arabic, Wainak Ya Allah, meaning, where are you, God? God, where are you? Is a 3,000-year-old lament which the inhabitants of Palestine, irrespective of their religion, Jewish, Christian, or Muslims have passed from one generation to the next while enduring an occupation after the other. It is a question that echoes throughout the Bible. It is a question of a people whose faith is continually tested. They do not question the existence of God, nor his care, but they wonder why he is not moving. He sees his people being oppressed. He knows how they are being treated. And yet he seems to be so silent. 
The cry is supposed to shake him so that he awakes, acts, and delivers. Living under Israeli occupation almost all of my life, going through 10 wars in 53 years, that means every five years we have a war. Now it's actually down to every two years. Seeing that which people work so hard to build and called home, including their dreams repeatedly destroyed. You saw the images from Gaza last year. And being suffocated by the Israeli occupation generates this old yet ever new query, God, where are you? Yet throughout the Bible, and with the exception of the Exodus, the God in whom the people of Palestine put their faith appears to be silent. He sees the Assyrians resettling his people and does nothing. He watches the Babylonians desecrate his temple and he doesn't move an inch. His capital is destroyed by the Romans and he appears not to care. Even when his only beloved son is hung on the cross, he is absconditus, absent and seems to hide. This has been the experience of the people of Palestine throughout his history, irrespective of their religious affiliation. When the Persian in 614 destroyed over 3,000 churches in Palestine and little was left with the exception of the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem, God did nothing to push the invaders back. When the Crusaders blundered churches in the Holy Land, God did not move a finger. When the Palestinians were driven out of their homes in 1948, which we call a Nakba, the catastrophe, God was silent. When the Church of the Nativity was besieged in 2002 and I was there in the middle of all of that, God did not interfere. And when 10,000 of Christians are kicked out of the Middle East these days, neither God nor the so-called Christian world seems to do anything. The God in which the people of Palestine put their faith seems to be weak and not up to the challenge of the occupying empires. Like his people, he does not appear to have the means and resources to confront the occupying empires. And so the old question still echoes today, God, where are you? Dear sisters and brothers, it is not by chance that the divine revelation took place in Palestine. The revelation was not the notion that there is a God somewhere. But biblical revelation was the response to that existential question, where are you, God? The people of Palestine, our forefathers and foremothers, were able to discover a unique answer to God, where are you? And that response made history. God was visible and omnipresent in the empire where there were grand shrines and temples which represented not only his glory but that of the empire. The God of the empire was omnipotent as the empire. Indeed, his power and that of the empire were almost interchangeable. He was a victorious God, a good match for a victorious empire. But at the other end of the spectrum, there was the God of the people of Palestine, whose tiny territory resembled a corridor in Middle Eastern geography. His country lacked resources and power. Above all, this God appeared to be weak compared with other gods. He seemed forever to be on the losing end, just like his people. This God was almost interchangeable with his people. 
His weakness was shown in theirs, and their defeat was his. This God was a loser. He lost almost all wars, and his people were forced to pay the price of those defeats. In short, God did not appear to be up to the challenge of the various occupying empires. His people in Palestine were forced to hear the mocking voices of their neighbors who taunted, where is your God? The revelation the people of Palestine received was the ability to spot God where no one else was able to, was able to see him and to find him in the most unexpected places. When his people were driven as slaves into Babylon, they witnessed him accompanying them. When his capital was destroyed and his temple blundered, he appeared to them in the ashes. When his people were defeated, he carried the defeat with them. The salient feature of this God was that he did not run away when his people faced their destiny, but remained with them, showing solidarity and choosing to share their destiny. Consequently and ultimately, Jesus revealed this God on the cross. In a situation of terrible agony and pain, when he was brutally crushed by the empire, and hanged like a rebellious freedom fighter. The cross became the ultimate unexpected place for God's revelation. The people of Palestine could then say with great certainty, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we, just as we Palestinians. Indeed, what Jesus and I share in common, beside being both born in Bethlehem, is the fact that we had to spend our life under occupation. Jesus under Roman occupation, and I under Israeli occupation. For the people of Palestine, the fact that God revealed himself in the most unexpected place of Palestine meant that defeat in the face of the empire was not an ultimate defeat. It meant that after the country was devastated by the Babylonians, when everything seems to be lost, a new beginning was possible. Even when the dwelling place of God was destroyed, God survived that destruction, developing in response a dwelling that was indestructible. And when Jesus cried on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That soul-rending plea was just the prelude to the resurrection. The revelation made in Palestine was that God was to be found in the most unexpected places and where no one expected him. To the Greek, this sounded like foolishness. And even for Jews, it was just a stumbling block. But for Paul, such a revelation was nothing less than the power of God and the wisdom of God. This revelation was and is of utmost importance, for it enabled the people of Palestine to survive all defeats. It made the defeat lose its teeth, death lose its sting, and empire lose its victory. It ensured that empires were incapable of celebrating their victories, because while they crushed the people they occupied, they weren't able to crush their spirit. This is precisely what the aforementioned revelation to, did to the people of Palestine. It helped them not to surrender after each defeat, but to pick themselves up 
and start over again. It made them develop an art of resilience to survive extremist empires. Hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. When visitors come to Bethlehem, they get depressed for the lack of political perspective after a few hours. From seeing the wall surrounding the little town from three sides, from experiencing the segregation system that is being entrenched. But then they tour our ministries. They watch Palestinian kids dancing with joys in their eyes. Christians and Muslim girls playing soccer with a pride in their faces. Students at our university college producing films that tells the human side of our story. And elderly writing books, sharing their lifelong experiences with a younger generation. Then our guests discover God in unexpected places. Palestine was the unexpected place for God to reveal himself. After the revelation of God at that ultimate unexpected place at the cross, there is no place on earth, in history, in your life or biography, where God cannot reveal himself. He is there where we do not expect him. There when we do not count on him, there when hope seems lost forever. The good news proclaimed in Palestine on the cross was and is, expect God in the most unexpected places. Who would have thought that nine American Jewish women and men will be here at the UCC to lobby for Palestinian rights and to urge the UCC to divest God in unexpected places. I have no doubt change is coming to Palestine. I'm certain freedom is coming. I'm convinced justice is coming, but be prepared. God might use the UCC, you and me, to bring that change. We become the unexpected places that God will use to bring change to Palestine and to our world. Amen.